黒と悪口に。Uncle Tungsten by Oliver Sacks. This is a wonderful book. I read it、uh, quite a few years ago now.、Um, it, it has uh, a, a particular paragraph in it in which I was convinced he was talking about a periodic table in the Kensington Science Museum. I thought he meant a table, like a flat thing that you would put stuff on.、Uh, and other people have read this paragraph in the same way. And it turns out,、uh, if you keep reading,、um, it's not that at all. It's just on the wall, same as everybody else's periodic table. And this was so disappointing to me that nobody had actually built. A periodic table, table that I thought I needed to do something about that. So, so I built one.、Uh, we happened to need a conference table at the same time, and it never worked as a conference table. But, whatever.、Um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a table. It's an actual physical table.、Um, and、uh, this is what it looks like after I discovered eBay.、Um, this is what it looked like a couple years after that.、Um, this is Oliver Sacks who came to visit it. Uh, because it had become reasonably well known in the, the element collecting world.、Um, and he, I, I see him a couple times a year, and he always asks me, Is this really all my fault? Like, was it, was it my bad writing that made you do all this? And it's like, Yup, yup, that, that's about it.、Um, so it,、um, the periodic table, table won the 2002 Ig Nobel Joke Prize in Chemistry、uh, because it is, in fact, completely useless.、Um, This led to,、uh, to Popular Science asking me to write a monthly column. I have no idea what made them think that I would be qualified to do that.、Um, but anyway,、uh, I've been doing it ever since. It's now almost 10 years.、Um, after the first five years, when I first started in the second month, I thought, you know, if I kept this up for five years, I would have enough columns to do a book.、Um, and sure enough, like clockwork, five years later,、um, Mad Science came out, collected columns.、Um, One of the nice things about the book is that I get more than one page.、Uh, so, this is the picture that we used in the magazine. In the book, we got to use the flaming disaster version of it also, which happened a few seconds after the previous one.、Um, uh, this being you know, the modern age, if you collect stuff, you have to make a website about it. So, this was my first website, periodictabletable.com.、Um, it looked kind of cheesy and mid 90s looking, although it was actually mid 2000s.、Um, But you know, it's just a hobby. Uh, uh, so after a while, I, I then I moved up to a much higher rent district, periodictable.com. It took me a year to convince the guy to sell it to me.、Um, interesting character, but anyway, I, I felt that I had a certain amount of claim to that, that domain name, and I finally got it、um, and made it look a little classier.、Uh, somewhere along the way, I decided to publish a poster, which is a little scary because I never really. You know, been a publisher myself before. It's very educational to find out what a hard business that is, print publishing.、Uh, 
Um, but this poster is done very nicely. You can buy it in any of the, the uh, finer science museums and, um, and everything. Uh, and then at some point I decided I, I should do a book. And I have a copy right here. So uh, this, this book came out in, um, for Christmas 2009. And I think it's a, it's a nice book. I mean, it's got pictures in it. Um, I, it's, it's got like nice big two-page spreads. Um, but what was frustrating about this book is that the whole time I was making it, I was thinking I really wish that I could do what I really want to do, which is an interactive electronic version of this book. Because every one of these pictures, essentially without exception, every one of the objects in here, I had photographed on a turntable around 360 degrees. I don't really know why, but it seemed like the thing to do. And so to make the print book, um, I mean, it took years and years to do that. But um, to make the print book, it was a process of throwing away 359 of those pictures to, to, to pick the one that we could put on paper. And it, you know, it was just obviously not the right way to do it. But at the time, you know, this was like more work than I'm willing to put into a free website. I already had a website that had all the stuff on it. And it was making a few hundred dollars a month in Google Ads or whatever. I'm not going to do that amount of work um, for a website. I, you know, I just I was like, how could you sell an ebook like that and make money on it and have it be worthwhile? Couldn't think of any way to do it. So, uh, but, you know, much as many other people, ironically, have have cashed in internet fame through print. Um, you know, I made a print book out of a website as a way of making money on it, which is just really dumb. But there you go. Um, because what was the choice? But then you see that Steve Jobs came from this higher realm that he occupies and came down and bestowed on us this product that none of us knew we needed or wanted and suddenly couldn't, couldn't live without. Uh, and it came attached to a store where all of a sudden it seemed realistic that you know, if you were to do something like this, maybe people would want to read it and maybe there would actually be kind of a cultural space in which it was socially acceptable to pay for it, namely the App Store. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and it would be finally a place to kind of make the version of the book that I wanted to. Um, and it's really very simple. I mean, the, the only thing that this book does, different, the ebook does different from the paper book, is that the objects can rotate. Uh, and you know, it's the same text. It's basically the same organization. It's just the things rotate. And this is exactly what I wanted to do. I have no interest in making sort of a big complicated app with lots of features and everything. It's just, you know, I wanted the best possible version of a book about stuff. You know, this is fundamentally a book about material objects. They're all sitting in my office. Um, and I wanted to give people the closest experience to being in my office and picking these things up and looking at them. Um, you know, if you'd like, like, like Harry Potter's version of this book, if he takes this out of the Hogwarts library, what's it going to do? It's going to do one thing, which is the objects are going to come up off the screen and they're going to turn, or off the paper, or whatever in his case. Uh, you're going to be able to pick them up and look at them. Maybe you could feel their texture, whatever. You'd sort of three them in three, 3D. And what's the closest that I could do to that? And the answer is I can make them rotate. I can make them come up in 3D. You can actually have a stereo view if you have little glasses. They'll pop off the screen. Um, and you know that's, that's pretty good. Um, so that, that's the origin of the Elements app. It's just simply I had these rotations, and I had a book, and suddenly there was a device. And there was 60 days in which to, to make it. So we, you know, we, we decided to start doing it on the first day. We spent 60 days doing it. And then we shipped it simultaneously with the iPad launch. Uh, and this was, it turned out this was really like a worthwhile thing to do. Um, it was like 280,000 copies so far at, at $14 a piece. And that's it's like, good, that's good. Um, so, so we thought, you know, let's do it again. You know, let's make another one. Uh, because it seemed like people liked the first one. So, um, we formed a company, uh, myself and Max Whitby, who's a, a film producer, television producer uh, in, based in London, and Stephen Wolfram, who is my partner in Wolfram Research, which is a previous occupation. Um, and we've released about a dozen titles so far. Um, this is uh, uh, a, a list of them. And I'm going to show examples from several of these later on. Um, and so we spent basically two years now pretending to be uh, 
a company that knows what to do about ebooks and sort of experimentally determining such things as you know how much money should you spend on producing one, uh, what kind of topics do people like, what kind of features, how do you market them? We haven't figured that one out yet. Um, you know, we've learned a lot of lessons. So what I want to do is kind of sort of tell you some of the things that we've learned. Uh, I think these are kind of very personal experiences to us. They may not apply to many other kinds of apps. Um, we also, you know, we have some children's books, but we don't really think of ourselves as uh, either a children's app company or uh, or a, an educational company. We, you know, we're we're like a trade book publisher is the closest thing, and so we have a you know a fairly wide spectrum of um, types of titles that we publish. Um, and so the first thing that I think is is just crucial is that you have to decide what it is that you want to do. You know, what, what effect do you want to have on your customers, your readers, or your viewers, whatever you call them? Um, focus. And there's, you know, entertainment is a great focus. It's not what we've chosen. Um, uh, you know, games are fine, not what we do. Um, enabling people through utilities, uh, you know, there's all kinds of different things that an app might do. The one that we decided is enlightenment. We, you know, we would like to be a company that, you know, after you've used one of our products, read one of our books, uh, you feel like you've learned something. You've somehow become a better person or, um, you know, you, your time was well spent with our product. Um, and it, particularly, we would also like parents to feel that way about their kids using our product. We would like them to think that, you know, if they get this app for their kid, uh, and their kid spends a couple hours with it, this was like a good thing that that happened, which is not the case with many apps. It's like a lot of things like, don't get angry birds because you're just gonna waste so much time. Um, and that's kind, of, that's kind of our focus. And the, the, the way in which we set about to do that is by telling stories because I think that you know, telling stories has been the way in which communication, education happens since the invention of the campfire, which I think is the current thinking is that it was the campfire that really kind of caused culture and, and, and intergenerational learning to start happening. Um, it's always been about stories. So there's three things that, that uh, we kind of feel are important. I think some of these we've determined, we can actually, actually say this by on the basis of having you know, made some apps and seen what works and what doesn't work. Uh, other things are just kind of my own opinion you, and unsupported by any evidence, but um, you know, I guess you can try to figure out which is which. Is which. Um, and it's surprising the number of, of companies that are in this sphere who don't get it about a number of these things, and I'll have some examples. Um, so, so story, like I said, story is the number one thing. Um, and this is something that both myself and Max Whitby, you know, I come from a background as an author, Max is a television producer. Um, we really understand stories. Uh, a number of types of companies don't understand stories, like video game companies are notorious for not understanding story. They put, you know, they make the video game and then they put in a cut scene that's two minutes long and it just annoys everybody. Uh, and the reason is because it's, it's a bad story. Like they didn't get a good writer or a good director to produce that cutscene. Avatar is a two-hour cutscene, you know, but it's a really good one because it was made by people who understand story. Um, so, uh, if we just, if it's, if it's quick to switch over, can we do that? Um, oh, good. Okay. Um, so, two examples where, where sort of the story aspect was. Important. Important. Um, so this is Solar System, is our second title, uh, also very successful. Um, this is, you know, is it Solar System by Marcus Chone? Um, I think he's not that well known in the U.S., but he's quite well known in the U.K. as a science writer. He's a good writer. Um, his text is entertaining. Um, you know, it's got it's got stuff you can do, but really, what it, this is, it's a book for reading. Um, uh, another example of a really story-centered one is Skulls. Um, whoops, what have I done here? Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, this is a book about skulls. It's our least commercially successful one, um, but I think probably our finest work in many other ways. Uh, and in this case, it's written by, um, how do I get back? Uh, context, there we go. Uh, it's by Simon Winchester, who's a very well-known natural history author. Um, and it's a good story. 
Uh, one piece of evidence about that is that uh, both Solar System and Skulls are being made into print books. Solar System is already out in bookstores now. Skulls will be soon. Um, and you know they're they're good stories, so they make sense in you know in, in other media too. Um, so we think it's very important to uh, respect the author uh, as an important uh, you know creative contributor, perhaps the creative contributor to uh, to the app. Um, and like I say, not all companies understand that. Video game companies, in particular, have difficulty working with authors. Um, programming. Um, is, uh, is an example of something that, uh, let's say, book publishers typically have a, very, uh, they have a very hard time understanding that a good programmer, a good software developer, a good user interface designer, these people are important creative people. A good one is every bit as rare and as much of an artistic genius as a good writer or a good painter. Uh, that's something that video companies totally understand. They know that you know, their games live and die by the quality of their software developers, and they treat them well, and they don't try to go, you know, for a low bid, you know, outside contract somewhere. That would be nuts, you know, because these are the stars of their industry, um, and you know, so so we try to appreciate that, uh, and you know, I, I come from a software background, um, so for example, in Solar System we have this orrery thing, and um, you know, if I had practiced. Uh, I'd be able to set this up to show you uh, to show you their clips, but unfortunately I didn't. So, uh, and we're not a we're not like a night sky viewing thing, but something like that. You know, there's an alignment here. The moon is getting in the way of the sun. And, uh, anyway, so this this is you know it's not it's not super rocket science, but it's a it's a bit of um, a bit of programming to get this to work right. You can go to different planets and. See all their moons, and you can look like if you lived on this moon. Uh, now that's the center of the universe. So, like, what is your view of if you were an astronomer living on Titan and you were trying to figure out uh, how the solar system was put together? Like, you'd never figure it out because the movements are way too complicated. Um, anyway, so so programmers and respect for them uh, is is important. Um, uh, if we could switch back here, maybe I'll stop the sound. Um, so the the third thing is uh, uh, respect for the importance uh, of visual media and the creation of visual media. Um, so I mean, for example, I you know I come from a software background. I believe that programmers are important. Um, but if you asked me, like, how would you get uh, I don't know three or four dozen well-known actors and actresses to perform 154 of Shakespeare's sonnets and film that to high quality for a reasonable budget. You know, my response would be, are you nuts? Like, A, I don't think you can do it, and how on earth could you possibly do that in any reasonable length of time and for any reasonable amount of money? And I just, you know, forget it. Um, you, you know, Max, on the other hand, comes from a, a background in television, so he said, oh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll call John Wyver, and he'll do it for us. And so this is um, this is not out yet, but it's coming out fairly soon. This is our sonnets project. So we've got, like, for example, we've got Doctor Who right there, David Tennant. Um, we've got Captain Picard. Um, uh, we've got um, Fiona Shaw, who actually does a better job than any of these other people. Let me just play you one of these. Um, When I consider everything that grows holds in perfection but a little moment, that this huge stage presenteth naught but shows whereon the stars in secret influence comment. When I perceive that men as plants increase, cheered and checked even by the self-same sky, vaunt in their youthful sap at height decrease and wear their brave state out of memory. Then the conceit of this inconstant stay sets you most rich in youth before my sight, where wasteful time debateth with decay 
to change your day of youth to sullied night. And all in war with time for love of you as he takes from you I engraft you new. I have no idea how to do that. Right? I'm a, I'm a programmer type person. Um, but, uh, and this is something that, you know, print publishing companies, games companies, they don't know how to do it either. Um, and as a result, when, uh, you know, companies with that sort of background try to make apps, faced with the prospect of needing this sort of material, the natural response is, well, we can't possibly create this ourselves. We'll have to take something that exists, you know, some existing television show or whatever, and chop it up. And there's so many apps you can see. There's one that just came out fairly recently, uh, competitive with one of ours, which is exactly what they did. And it shows, you know, it's like this used to be a television show, and somebody chopped it up, and it kind of works as an app, but it's really not quite right. Um, and if you want to do this new medium right, uh, you have to, you know, you have to uh, embrace the fact that there are people out there outside of your company who know how to do this kind of stuff and can do it from scratch and, you know, can, can make it work. Um, so, you know, that's, that's what we've done. Um, so that's, that's sort of the three, the three uh, things that, that we've learned and that we feel you need to bring into the app. Another thing which I think is equally important is the stuff you need to exclude uh, as much as possible. Um, I mean, it's, it's really important to resist the temptation to put in distractions because, you know, you think they're cool or, you know, you, you, you think they're somehow necessary. I mean, if you look at a game like Minecraft, for example, uh, this is a brilliant and important game because it's, it's pure. They, it's just, it's very simple, it's pure, it's a construction world. There are no cut scenes. There are no, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing to distract you from the fact that this is a place where you go and you build things. Uh, and it's beautiful because of that. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a high distraction and there's many examples out there of apps or, or e-books which you could describe basically as this is a good story and then somebody has added distractions to it. Um, uh, because, you know, because it's what you do, you know, it's an app, we can do this, we can program this or that or the other thing. Is there? Okay. So I'm gesturing here that makes me think there's a problem. Um, and you always have to think, like, am I adding this feature because I think it's cool or because it adds in some meaningful way to the core content? Does it help communicate what I'm trying to communicate? Um, and I think there's a good rule of thumb, which applies to movie making as well, which is throw out your favorite scene. You know, whatever it is that you think is the best thing in the whole product, that's what you should throw out. And the reason is because the chances are that the reason you think it's so cool is because you're really proud of it. It's got some really clever thing, some, you know, brilliant piece of engineering that might be absolutely amazingly appropriate for some other app. But the reason you want to put it in this one is because you want to show off, or you know, you're just really proud of it, um, and not because it's actually the right thing for this product. And that's a very difficult thing to do, uh, and it's why you sometimes have to have like more than one person involved who can browbeat the other people. Uh, I'll, I'll show you sort of two examples: um, one where we left it in, one where we took it out. Or actually, no, sorry, it's two examples where we left it in, one where we should have taken it out. Uh, because I decided I wasn't going to criticize anybody else's apps in this talk because they're probably here. Um, so I'm only going to criticize our own apps. Uh, so this, this is um, Elements. And uh, so this is a home page. If you go to a particular element, you'll see the thing rotating. And now if I go to the second page, watch closely what happens. Uh, the objects kind of fly in. See how they kind of they, they fly in? And then you can spin them. And you do this again, uh, and then they, and they fly in again. Um, this spin down movie, as it's called, I was really pleased with myself for figuring out how to do that. Remember, we only had 60 days to, to create all of this. And um, it was, you know, Max was like, no, that's a gimmick. You know, it, it's just, it's stupid. And it's, you're just showing off, is exactly his attitude towards it. 
Um, my response is, okay, but we need the time. We need four-thirds of a second to get these rotations loaded so that they will appear as if they have always worked. Uh, and furthermore, you know, by putting something moving on the screen, it'll actually make it seem a little faster than it really is. It'll kind of disguise that, um, and that was not enough for him. But what finally convinced him was um, that it, it demonstrates what the objects can do. And if you go to like hydrogen, for example, you'll see um, that the one up here, this one, shows you that it's a little video here. The others rotate, that one kind of plays through just a little bit. So it's kind of demonstrating that these are touchable objects. And that, that's enough communication to kind of justify it and, and buy its way in. And I think when we do the, the update for uh, new languages and new, new resolution, uh, we're going to leave the spin down movies in because I think they've earned their keep. I think they're worth it. Um, now let me show you. Uh, so this is Leonardo. Uh, this is um, uh, an app about Leonardo da Vinci's anatomical drawings, which we did in cooperation with Her Majesty the Queen, um, who owns all of these drawings. Um, and they are amazing drawings. Uh, uh, let's see if we go to selections. Um, I don't know. So uh, there's like 200 of them, and they're unbelievable. And they're, they're actually um, quite small. They're about the size of an iPad screen. Many of them. So when you, you know, you're, you're looking at them practically life size, but you can also zoom in. Um, but here's the problem he wrote all of these captions in mirror imaged Italian, and his handwriting sucks. And he didn't do this because he was, it was not like a secret code. He was just, they're just notes to himself. He didn't intend anybody else to read them. Um, and he was left handed and he didn't want to smear the ink, so he wrote backwards. Um, but it's kind of hard to read. Uh, and it's also archaic Italian, so, you know. So the first thing we have is a button which says translate. And now everything becomes English and you can read it. And it's actually absolutely fascinating to read these descriptions because many of them are just like notes to himself, like he's jotted down, when you do your textbook, these were notes for a textbook which he never published. And it's like, when you do this, be sure you draw this in a certain way or don't forget that or, or whatever. Um, so this is all good. I think this is, this is a a beautiful thing, and I've learned lots uh, of history and anatomy by reading the English translations of his notes. We also put in this thing, mirror, which brings up the stupidest thing that our company has ever done. Um, and I'll tell you why it's stupid. It's because every time Max shows this to anybody, this is the first thing he shows them. And it's really cool. It's a mirror image thing. So you can read the Italian. It, it mirrors the Italian. And you can read the notes. Um, but you know, let's analyze why this is evil. Uh, and he told me not to criticize it, so I'm going to go overboard. Um, so first of all, it's less than a line long than a wide. Like if you were actually trying to read the reverse Italian, you'd have to go like that. Um, it's got a pretend glare on it. See how that looks like a silhouette there? I guess you can't really see it in the projector. The gamma's messing it up. But there's, uh, there's like pretend scratches on it to make it look like old glass, and pretend glare to make it look like you're seeing a reflection of yourself distorted in the magnifying glass. Um, it's like, this is, um, this is cute. But if we actually intended for people to be able to read the mirror image archaic Italian in bad handwriting, um, we would have put a third button here that said mirror the whole thing because then you could actually possibly be able to read it in a non-distracting and sort of stupid way. This is just a gimmick. It's, it's, it's cheap. Uh, people who spend time on it, playing with it, will realize several minutes later that they have spent time on a stupid distraction <laughs> that has taken them away from the most incredible anatomical drawings of the past 500 years that they could have been reading about. Uh, that they could have enjoyed, in the end, much more deeply than this little feature thing. Um, so, you know, that, I, I'm very unhappy with us for having done that. But, you know, sometimes you have to give Max what he wants. Um, so, like, like, you might be thinking, while I'm saying all this, come on, 
can't we have a little fun? You know, could, can we have just one little cute fun feature just for no reason in an app that's so serious? And I think putting it that way, you know, it kind of misses the point because um, when a feature like that is the most fun thing in your app, then you're probably doing it wrong because what you'd like to have is the underlying material, the actual content and story you're trying to tell be sufficiently compelling and interesting that people find that distracting and, and irritating because it gets in the way of them and the material. I mean, for example, if I actually could read Italian and knew enough archaic vocabulary to be able to read this stuff in reverse and actually wanted to read it in, in its the original Italian, I would be super pissed that the only way to do it is with an annoying thing that doesn't show me a whole line at a time. I would really want the feature of being able to flip the whole thing uh, to actually be able to read it because what he says is tremendously interesting. This is Leonardo da Vinci writing to himself you know, after he has been the first person in the world to discover some anatomical structure that no one else knew existed. Wouldn't you rather read about that than play with a, you know, with a, with a silly little feature? Um, uh, so, you know, I, I don't think of it as not having fun with cute features, but rather trying to put the effort into the real content. Um, uh, because ultimately, I think that, you know, people, people really want meaning, meaningful experiences, more so than they want entertainment. And I think this actually applies particularly to children. Uh, in, you know, unless you've kind of messed them up with too much crap, uh, they want to learn. They desperately want to learn. They want to master topics. Um, you know, they, they, uh, if you can give them a meaningful, deep experience, get them to care about something and then teach them about it, they actually like that better, just as adults do, than if you are successful in entertaining them. And furthermore, uh, thank you. Also, you know, companies like ours cannot possibly compete with the quality of something like Angry Birds in terms of pure mindless entertainment. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with mindless entertainment if that's what you want and you're just like you're really tired and you want to, you know, just, just veg out for a while. Um, fine, but Angry Birds does that incredibly much better than anything that we would ever, ever be able to do. And trying to compete with it is nuts. And it's also not what people come to our sort of product for. Uh, if, if, you know, if people come to you for enrichment and you give them distractions, they're going to be unsatisfied. Um, so, yeah, so I mean you have to basically trust that if you give people a strong story, they will respond to it, uh, at, you know, including children. Um, so, uh, yeah, so actually, I guess I sort of already said this, that, that one of the consequences of putting, you know, putting most of our effort into the content and not the distractions is that we've actually come up with some pretty good content. So Solar System, for example, um, it's actually doing fairly well as a print book, which is, which is nice. Um, it's also a way of um, getting some money from people who don't own iPads, which is kind of, you know, one, one of the problems that I think we, it's something we need to kind of work on more as a company because we've, we spent so much money on these, you know, on, on, on the production of some of these titles, and we're slowly starting to realize that, you know, actually we've got something, and there's only like a pretty small percentage of people in the world who are eligible to give us money for it, and that's not the smartest thing in the world. So, um, you know, so we're trying to make more of an effort, uh, you know. So, Skulls, for example, this will be coming out for Christmas this year. I think it's going to be a fabulous book in print. You know, it's an A-list author. The photography is beautiful. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, the Fiona Shaw performance of The Wasteland, for example, which was our, our third or fourth product, um, you know, that's a major piece of filmmaking. It's an incredible performance of The Wasteland. I'm going to play you a minute of it just, just because. Um, and it's sort of nuts that we're not selling it uh, in the iTunes store as a video download or as a DVD, like an actual physical DVD, because people should be able to watch this, even if they don't have an iPad. April is the cruelest month. Breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, 
stirring dull roots with spring rain. Winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow, feeding a little life with dried tubers. Summer surprised us coming over the Starnbergese with a shower of rain. We stopped in the colonnade and went on in sunlight into the Hofgarten and drank coffee and talked for an hour. Bin gar keine Huschenstamm, außer Teuen, echt Deutsch. And when we were children, staying at the Archduke's, my cousins, he took us out in a sleigh and I was frightened. He said, Marie, Marie, hold on tight. And down we went. In the mountains there you feel free. I read much of the night and go south in the winter. That's not fair to leave that only in an iPad app. Uh, and I think that's something that, um, you know, that we, that we intend to work on more as we go forward and trying to kind of, you know, take this content and make it available elsewhere, as opposed to the other way around. You know, I think the center of gravity is shifting from, you know, print publishers and television companies creating a lot of content, which then gets force-fit and shoehorned uh, into an app. Let's do it the other way around. Let's, let's, let's create really good stuff, optimized, built from scratch for an app, and then, you know, there's actually a better starting point for creating other kinds of media in many cases. Um, uh, so that's what we want to do. So um, the last thing I kind of wanted to talk about was uh, children's apps, books, and things. And so this book, um, this book is, uh, I didn't think this was a children's book. I, I absolutely did not write it as a children's book. I was just kind of writing stuff that I thought was interesting. Um, and I didn't really think about who might want to read it other than maybe, you know, somebody else like me might want to read it. Um, and I didn't, you know, I, I have, having written for popular science for a long time, I kind of have trained myself not to use a lot of jargon and technical terminology and such because I mostly don't really know it anyway. Um, so I write, I guess, in a fairly, you know, straightforward style. Um, but it turns out that actually, apparently most of the people who read this book are children. This is a kid that came to one of my book signings recently and wanted his arm signed. It's like, I did not sign up for this. I don't know, I don't understand. Why are all these, you know, seven and eight-year-olds reading my book? Um, and that's like who comes to the book signings. And I think the reason is because it's, you know, it speaks plainly in, in fairly straightforward language, not at all sort of dumbed down. Um, about stuff that I thought was interesting, and apparently I'm kind of childlike or something, uh, uh, and you know, and children responded to that, and I think you know parents also responded to it. You know, to some extent, this is like the parents are buying this and saying, "Here, read this; it'll it'll make you better." But I don't think they come to the book signings unless they actually did read it. Um, and I think again, this kind of uh, this comes back to trusting your audience. Kids are really smart. Kids want to learn. If you give them something meaningful, they will engage with it. If you give them a bunch of you know, flashy distractions, you know, first of all, it's not a good thing to do. And they kind of see through it. And th there's nothing that enrages me more than seeing uh, you know, science television shows, obviously produced by people who think science is boring, and that the only way you can possibly make television out of it is to kind of cut it up and put lots of flashy editing and big you know, starbursts and all this, all this stuff that's distracting. I, I don't think kids like that. I think they may be tolerated if they have to, but what they really want is, tell me the real stuff. Tell me what's actually going on in the world. Teach me so that I can become a grown-up, because that's what kids want more than anything else in the world, is to grow up and to take their place in the world. Um, okay, so okay, now I'll tell you our three secrets um, for you know, how we kind of operate our company. Um, uh, first one is respect. A as I said, you know, in more depth, I think respecting the fact that both, that, that authors are important people, respecting the fact that programmers and software developers and interface designers are not people you hire on a low bid or as work for hire or as, you know, just sort of a, an afterthought. Uh, this is important. Um, 
if you're a software developer, respecting that writers and artists actually know stuff that you don't and that they can do things in their sleep that you can only dream of. That's a little line I wrote for the speech. Um, you know, they, they actually are able to do things that, that are amazing and, and, a, and a sight to behold um, that, uh, you know, people who are comfortable with software development don't, don't understand. Um, uh, second thing is partnerships. Uh, there's no possible way that, you know, we have about 25 employees. We're a very small company. There's no possible way that we could do all of this stuff without uh, deep partnerships with really good companies. So, you know, Leonardo, that was done in partnership with the Royal Collection, uh, which knows, you know, they've owned this stuff for, what, 500 years or something. Uh, they know about it. Um, we've done several partnerships with Faber and Faber, which is a very well-respected British publisher, Barefoot Books. Um, and of course, I will have forgotten somebody that will be offended, but, you know, we, we've, we've worked with, um, you know, a number of different publishers, and we consider that very important. We're, there's no contracting going on here. These are co-published, both sides, usually sharing 50-50 in many cases. Um, you know, both people kind of working to do the best job that, that can be. Um, and, you know, one of the main reasons for going to these sorts of companies is that's where the talent is. Solar System was a Faber and Faber project because Marcus Chone is a Faber and Faber author. And if you want the best author, you know, you go work with where he wants to work. Um, and the third thing is persistence. Uh, I think it's, it's fairly universal in, in uh, publishing operations, be it print publishing or music publishing or television uh, publishing, that, you know, anybody who says they can tell you what's going to be a hit is lying. You know, there's a few exceptions, maybe like, doing another novel about vampires, that's a pretty good bet, at least for another year or so. Um, but, you know, by and large, you have to accept the fact that there's, you know, some of your best work is not going to sell well, and you're going to have a, a, you know, a hit you never could have predicted, uh, and no, nobody in your company is going to be able to agree ahead of time which of the titles are the important ones. Um, so, you know, you have to kind of keep at it. And we've been fortunate enough to, you know, to have enough successful products out of the dozen or so that we've released to kind of keep the show going, keep the lights on around. Um, but we've also had some, you know, some absolutely miserable failures, commercially speaking. I don't think we've had any sort of technical failures. Um, but, you know, we, we intend to keep at this. And we, 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 we were planning to institute a new policy of publishing only hits, but then we decided that would be too easy. So, you know, we're going to keep going at it, doing good work, and hoping that it finds an audience. Uh, so now I will, you know, trust my audience that if you're interested, uh, you can go to touchpress.com or periodictable.com. And uh, thank you very much. I guess, thank you. The, I guess the one thing we didn't address is, is what Warren referred to as the elephant in the room, which is the fact that there's an eclipse going on. Uh, I think it started a, a little while ago, but will not actually be significantly visible uh, until about 6.30. But um, I'm happy to take questions for as long as you can, you can stand not going to looking at the sun and blinding yourself. Just a quick question. Sure. Loved, absolutely loved your presentation. Amazing. Um, how do you come up with which projects you want to do, and what do you have slated next? Um, so, uh, we, we're in the enviable position of having released a successful product right out of the gate. In fact, before the company existed, Touch Press was founded in order to have a shingle to hang out in case Elements was successful. Um, so uh, it, it brought in a lot of in, you know, inquiries and interest. And pretty much all the projects we're doing, with, with one exception, are things that, you know, ideas that came ready-made with a partner. Um, uh, you know, either there was like something that we really uh, knew about and we could go to the part and they said, oh yeah, Elements, that's great, sure, we'll work with you. Or they came to us um, and, you know, and we've, we've tried to refine our process of figuring out what projects to do. And I think that over time it will be, you know, it will become harder to, you know, to, to pick ones. But the fact of the matter is that there's an awful lot of low-hanging fruit in the world of, you know, there's way more really great topics than there is capital within our company to do them to the standard that we want to. So, 
you know, we, we kind of do, we just guess, really, okay, I'll admit it, we just guess, and, and then try to find a good partner um, to do it with. Um, I was just wondering how you set your price points. Um, some of them are a little bit higher than other apps, yeah, yeah. and whether you've done any experimenting right. there. Okay, so I don't know if you remember, um, right around the time of the iPad launch, a little before, there was a, um, this very big public battle between Amazon and one of the major publishers in which they actually withdrew all of that publisher's print books from Amazon for a few days as a, an attempt to intimidate them or something. And uh, this was a battle over ebook pricing, and they were drawing the line. The publisher wanted ebooks to cost $12.99, and Amazon wanted them to cost $9.99. And they were like, they were going to beat each other up over this. And, it, and, and the, the publisher finally won, and it's kind of $12.99 became, a, a, for the time anyway, established. And, 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 and my feeling was that our books were better than any of that publisher's books, and that they should cost a dollar more. Um, so we set the price at $13.99. Um, and that's, you know, there you go, that's why. Um, and, you know, to, to, to back that up a little bit with some sort of reason other than just raw emotional uh, arrogance or something, um, you know, price sets a signal, it sends a signal, you know, and we put a lot of time and effort and money into producing these books, and there's a lot more in them than in a, the typical app, and, you know, I, I feel like the, the slightly higher price, but first, it's still half the price of a print book, it's not like we're gouging people, um, and it kind of signals, like, this is a, this is a premium app, this is going to take up a lot of memory on your device, you know, it's like a big thing, you, and, and the price helps to signal that, in a sense. It's not so much that the, the amount of content in there justifies the price, it's more that the price communicates to people how much stuff is in there. Um, I have no idea if that works or not. We're not organized enough to actually do market research or like ask people or anything like that. Um, in the case of children's titles, you know, things like the Barefoot Books Atlas um, or, or Access for X-Ray, Children's books just always cost less, and I don't know why. I mean, you can get this a two-inch thick, full-color book for you know four ninety-nine or something. I have no idea how they do it, but everyone seems to agree that children's books cost less, and so we kind of adopted that too. That that our children's titles cost less than our our titles for adults. Um, whether we're going to be able to hold this price, whether it's a good idea or not. Um, it's one of those huge unknowns. I mean, if we had priced elements at half the price, would we have sold more than twice as many? Absolutely no idea. And I have no clue how to find out either because the, you know, our titles are so unique and the circumstances around each one are so different that, you know, and the dangers of doing a, of, of shooting low and never being able to raise the price again, very risky business. Um, who knows? I certainly don't. But I still want mine to cost a dollar more than the other guys, because I think we worked harder on them. Any other questions? Oh, the furthest from me. In terms of, you, you mentioned that you were going to go to the higher resolution, the retina display, and I'm also wondering about anything that you're doing in the art world and the idea of having the better resolution for uh, images that might come from famous museums. Um, yeah, so we're, we are going to do a new version of Elements fairly soon uh, with, with um, maybe not necessarily full screen retina resolution of every object because we just can't, like two gigabytes is the limit for several reasons. Um, uh, art, flat art, you know, like paintings. Um, I have always had a difficult time um, figuring out what to do with it. I mean, so Leonardo, um, there's like a, 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 you should go back to that, I suppose. Um, you know, here, there's a, a number of um, things that that we do um, that really kind of makes sense as interactive, like that they add something beyond just being able to zoom. I mean, obviously you can put a painting on an app and you can zoom it, and that's great. But I don't think that alone makes for uh, 
you know, a compelling and interesting interactive experience. And furthermore, I think if you have, like what is the best way of presenting a painting short of being in the museum and actually seeing the painting? I think probably the best way to communicate a painting to somebody who doesn't have the actual painting is a nice large format color print of it. Um, it's just, it's bigger and, you know, it's, I don't think that the interactive medium adds enough to justify it and to make it a better presentation than a print book for a painting that you don't know what else to do with. Like I say, Leonardo, the translation in place, this is what sells it for me um, as, as making this worthwhile. The only other place you were able to get these translations was in one like very short print run art book that costs 2,000 pounds or something, and of which there are a few copies. Um, now everyone can see this, well, everyone has an iPad. Uh, um, and there's, a, there's other things like this, uh, like this uh, navigation body. This is, a, this is a meaningfully useful way, like you can go, let's see, you can get this down to the skeleton um, and then touch a hand, and now you have just the places where he drew skeletal hands. Um, and that's like, that's not just a gimmick, that's actually a useful way of organizing the drawings and a useful way of choosing which drawing you'd like to see. Um, and so if there were a collection of, for example, there's a proposal to do Kandinsky, K Kandinsky. Um, and you know, that's somewhat attractive because he has a certain iconography that he uses that could be, you know, where, where, where we could make elements of the painting interactive in an interesting way. Um, but I don't like modern art, so I don't know. Um, uh, I think it, it basically boils down to I'm not sure what to do with paintings. And if we could figure out something really clever to do with paintings, then, then we'd do it. See the, oh, sorry, I can't hear. Maybe, maybe if you wait for the microphone, because I, I can't hear. I'm a painter and uh, an illustrator, and I would say that um, looking at a, a print book is the best way to look at a painting if you don't have it because as an illustrator there's something really awful that happens when you prepare um, files for print is that you have to switch from RGB to CMYK mm -hmm. and so that means all your dazzling blues um, have to be converted for print and you just you immediately cut out this amazing range of color when you convert for print so I think really the best way to look at real art is on a screen. Yeah, if you have a really good scan of it, but it's still the screen's awfully small. Um, I, I just I feel uncomfortable. But as a colorist, I think it's it's well, it, there's no contest as and a colorist. The, yeah, and the screens certainly are beautiful. And the iPad 3 screen is, I mean, the the color vibrancy in this thing is amazing, even compared to the one generation back iPad. Um, so yeah, there, there's actually there was a um, a project that came our way which we which we didn't do which involved uh, some some very old um, color transparencies using that that were made you know in the very very early days of photography using a technique that means they can't really be looked at because they there's some kind of vegetable dye or something and it fades very quickly when exposed to even moderate amounts of light and that would actually be a, a perfect case because they're they're transparencies they're meant to be viewed as you know back illuminated objects as opposed to paintings that are meant to be viewed with reflected light. Um, I, it's just, I mean, I, I'm, I just, I don't feel that pinch and zoom is like, is, is enough interactivity to really be interesting. And it's not so much that it's not interesting, it's that there's other things we can do with other types of media where we can, you know, do something more interesting. Like Picasso, for example, he did sculptures. And I think a, you know, a three-dimensional rotation of a Picasso sculpture is a better use of the technology. It's, it's, it's using the technology to do more than a pinch and zoom presentation of Picasso's drawings. Um, as an app producer, you could actually shift the light source on that painting so that you can actually see all the strokes, say, of a Van Gogh painting. Well, that would be um, interesting if, if there's texture that can be represented in a better way interactively than on paper. Yeah, that would be interesting, actually. Oh. No, something I wanted to say to you, I forgot what it was, though. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. Well, I'm sure we have one more question here. Yeah. 
Yeah, but it's, it is. It is now. I think. So the last question. Time, so. Last question. Because there's something else going on. There's an eclipse. There's, a, there's an eclipse on. We're supposed to go out and look Quick eclipse. Quick comment. Yep. I've used the elements with kids as young as second graders for hours and hours because they love to get into it. And today I taught biomimicry uh, with a TED video and went, went back to the, what the kids learned in the elements uh, about the structure of carbon or, you know, it, it's just so fantastic. Well, even you. for very young ones, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I get I get um, emails from from and, and like YouTube videos of, of I don't know two and three year olds that are singing the element song or that have memorized all the element names and it's like three three year old are you you know <laughs> whatever. Well, rock um, stars come in many forms, folks. I think you're seeing one. <laughs> I want you to know, Teo, that we uh, greatly appreciate your work, and, and we you. notice it, and it counts.